Uh, we're going to look at our next to last lesson uh, in the Perseverance of the Saints. This is Security Viewpoints Lesson 2 because we actually did the first and second of a, of a series of different viewpoints that the Bible is very clear about regarding the believer's uh, ability to persevere. And regardless of the perseverance, there is the preservation of God of the of the believer. And we looked at some things uh, Sunday. So I said this again. We'll say it again. We do not persevere to obtain eternal life. We do so because we have eternal life. That would be works for salvation if that were the case. Also, we saw the different words between ky- kainos and neos. One is a new kind in species. The other is just an upgrade of the old one. When you got saved, something new happened to you that wasn't there before. It's not reformation or turning over a new leaf. You know, uh, it is something that God does into you in the new birth. And you are a recipient of the imputation of the righteousness of God. You're a recipient of the imputation of um eternal life, which is an attribute of God, and you are also given uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as a possession is for Ephesians 1 and verse 13. That's an important part. There's other things as well, but you're not the same anymore. And so we should be different. We should be different. We're not a new version of the old you <laughs> or just somebody who's a little bit better quality. We're a different kind. Also, I noted that you are a new in kind creation. We also noted that the new creation will either learn by doctrine or will learn by discipline. Doesn't God doesn't throw out the baby with the bathwater because he, we've gotten stained in in life? He doesn't do that. We'll get a little bit more into that this evening. But we either learn through the truth and learn to make the adjustments. And our former pastor used to always say this. Some of you remember it. He used to say, life is a series of adjustments. Let's say you finally find yourself in hard times. You need to make the adjustment. Try, apply the word that applies to your circumstance and make the adjustment. You've had some hard times fall on you health-wise, friends-wise, spouse-wise, whatever, job-wise, whatever, and um, or you've got something really bothering you, you can't quite figure it out. And this, the adjustment that you make is that you, either way, as Paul said in Philippians 4, I've learned how to, to have much, and I've learned how to have little. And I have found that in all things, that, Christ Jesus strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ Jesus. I can be in poverty. I can be in riches. And I won't be a different person. I'll be the same person. I will keep going to church if I'm poor. I'll keep going to church if I'm rich. I'll keep going to church if my family turns on me. I'll keep going to church if I lose my job. I'm going to stay in the Word of God. I'm not going to, I'm not going to veer off because that's the test. You're going through a series of tests in life as a Christian, and that's how you earn your rewards, is you say, I'm going to stick with the word, I'm going to stick with it, I'm going to stick with the things of the Lord. I'm going to watch my P's and Q's along the way, and our behavior, as my parents used to call it, my mama used to say, watch your P's and Q's. I don't know what a P and a Q was, but I knew what a forsythia bush was. Oh, my word. (laughs) So I guess that's a nickname for a forsythia bush. I don't know. <laughs> I said someone the other day, I said I'd rather somebody use a stick on me, a bat on me, than a, a switch from a forsythia bush. But I digress. Trauma just waved over me right there when I was thinking about that. But you can learn by truth or you can learn by discipline. And discipline I think sometimes some Christians have the wrong concept of discipline, or sometimes people do in the human sense the wrong concept of discipline. You know, you shouldn't discipline your child. Yes, you should. If you love them, you'll discipline. Discipline doesn't mean beating the tar out of them. Now, every once in a while, you might have to get their attention, but it doesn't mean you're beating on them all. That's not what discipline means. Discipline is giving them guidance. And sometimes you have to make the guidance stricter because 
it, there's a danger involved in certain behaviors and things. And one thing that you cannot afford is disrespect under your own roof. You cannot have that. Because one of these days, they're going to be the master of their house. And uh, they, they need to have order in their home. And somebody, in order to have order in a home, like order in a nation, somebody's got to be in charge and not afraid to be in charge. When you're in charge, there's no consensus taken as to how that, you, or that you've got to take the lead on something. You just do it and you do the best you can and you support one another. And in parents, you have to work together. That's, that's something that has to go on. But we can learn by the disciplines of, of restrictions as well as a disciplines of learning and the disciplines of uh, controlling our behavior. There are a lot of things that we can do. But God does discipline us, and sometimes it is a corporal form of discipline from the divine hand of God, whether it's illness, sickness. And sometimes there are disciplines that God does like he did for Job, not because Job had done something wrong, but God was trying to guide him into a deeper relationship with him. You see, disciplines aren't just always corrective. They are sometimes preventive, and sometimes God uses them for a motivator. I had sergeants when I was in the Army that gave me certain tasks that they knew I would probably was not cut out for. But I was given those tasks anyway to see, and I failed miserably in some of those tasks, but in the process I learned how to do what I was called to do. And turned out pretty good for me. But the truth of the matter was, sometimes God has to lead you in ways as a form of discipline. So discipline is not always, you know, a whack attack. It is a way that God steers us. But it, we can learn that by just following instructions or doctrine. God has no mistakes in his foreknowledge. We noted that, that God knows who is going to believe. God doesn't have a mistake in his, that his foreknowledge comes under the heading of omniscience, his knowing, knows all things. He's got no mistakes in that. He, he didn't get surprised when I got saved. There's people that I've seen that got saved, and I'm sure that there were a lot of people who were surprised when Saul of Tarsus got saved. I mean, they were afraid of him for a while, and rightly so. But no, he, he was the real deal. God doesn't make any mistakes. And you are preserved, and that's the perfect tense. In Jude, verse 1, you are preserved, means you are made complete. In the past, with the result in the perfect tense of that word preserved there, means you are made complete in the past, with the result that you will always remain preserved in Jesus Christ. Well, we had a few more there. We are complete in him. We saw that. You say, well, I got a lot of growing up to do, but in his eyes, you're complete. You may be in the process of reflecting that completeness. And by growing in the word, you reflect God's values and learning his points of view and being submissive. We start to bloom or blossom where we're planted. In other words, you are still going to be who you are. All trespasses have been forgiven. Verse 13 of Colossians 2 says, All trespasses have been forgiven. The word all, all trespasses, past, present, and future, all trespasses have, Jesus is not going to come back and go through the ordeal of the cross again. Because that would be the only way. If you could lose your salvation, that would be the only way that God could be satisfied with the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus would have to be crucified over and over and over in order for God to be justified in, in saving you if he didn't save you from all of your sins at first. Jesus would have never, never come off the cross. And so in that essence, the crucifix would be true. I don't believe in following the crucifix. I believe the cross is empty and so is the tomb. The shedding of the blood is over with. The crucifixion is over with. The resurrection has happened to Christ. 
And when Jesus Christ forgave you for all of your sins, he gave you a pardon for the rest of your life. Now, what you do with it, that's up to you. What I do with it, that's up to me. We don't have to walk around with this question mark over our head all of our lives wondering, I wonder if I'll get in one of these days. Thirdly, we noted that being justified means declared righteous, DK. It's uh, that E there is an A that looks like an N with a long tail on the end. It's just, there's two E's, there's two O's, and there's two S's. Uh, anyway, DK is the way that word is pronounced there. It's the root word for uh, righteousness. And then dikaiosune, the S-U-N-E, the suffix there, it means justice. So it equals the integrity of God. But being justified, declared righteous, and see that A-O-R at Eris tense, the train has left the station. That's built into that word there. By being justified, we are declared righteous once and for all. You don't de- get declared a time over and then maybe later. No. Once and for all, thus, and thus you are saved forever. Future tense. Active voice. God does the saving. Indicative mood. No element of doubt. God does all of that. So that's good to know. So this is basics number 484, lesson 8, perseverance of the saints, and we pick up here. But let's pray. Father, we ask for your blessings on the word and those who are here tonight, that you'll bless us in our fellowship with you. Bless us in our fellowship with one another and strengthen us in our spiritual uh, mind and our perspicacity, our keenness of perception of the things of, of, of you and, and of our Savior and of your spirit and of your word and of your ways. Help us to understand that what we're doing this evening uh, is important for our edification, for our sustained happiness and for our strength against the powers and principalities against the world, the flesh, and, again, the devil. Thank you now for all you do. We ask you to bless us with understanding and and uh, knowledge that we can not only glean from your word and take to ourselves, but we can also share with others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Wrapping it up, our last lesson, look at the believer's position in Christ as being complete. And we looked at the sensible viewpoint of our salvation in God's Word. That was the first viewpoint. Number one was the sensible viewpoint. First of all was the position that is complete. Also, we have a sensible viewpoint that God did for us when we were lost sinners. How much more will He do for us now that we have been secured in Christ, as Romans 5, 9 says? Because it says we are saved from wrath through Him. It doesn't say you're preserved until you mess up. It says you're saved from wrath. We see how much God did for us as lost, condemned sinners. How much more he does for us that we are now his own children. He's adopted us into his family. We've taken on his likeness and that the imputation of his righteousness has been accredited to the credit side of the ledger of our soul. His word says he has preserved us from wrath, saving us from future judgment. It is nowhere seen when it says that God saves us as based on conditions. It's unconditional. Once we believe and accept the gospel, how we live now, his blessings are then conditional. You see, getting saved is believing on Jesus Christ for who he is and for what you are and what God has done for you and I. And when we're saved, we're saved forever. And once we're in the family of God, by that, it's an eternal relationship. But then after that, as far as God's blessings and remaining in God's favor as our Father and staying in the favor of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then it demands compliance. Jesus says, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I say to you. I think that's in John 15. So we're going to look at some other viewpoints, and we'll look at the held in God's hand viewpoint as the first one.
John chapter 10, if you would, John chapter 10, Gospel of John chapter 10. These are uh, comforting, and at the same time, they, they help us to have a greater capacity. Some people think, well, if you're once saved, always saved, that you just live any way you want. If you really love the Lord, and I think if you're really saved, God's going to draw you to Him, you're not going to sense that, that you have no obligations to God any longer. I think the Holy Spirit puts inside of every born-again person a sense of obligation to act like Jesus acted. Well, I know we don't always do it, but we're drawn to that all the time. It says, and I'll just read it to you, but we'll stay there, John. But in 1 John 2, 3, it says, And by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, that has experiential knowledge of salvation with him. And keeps his commandments and keeps not his commandments. Well, that person is a liar and the truth never was in him to start with. That person never was saved. But whoever keeps his word in him, verily is the love of God matured or perfected. And by this know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in Christ ought himself also to walk even as he walked. 1 John 2, 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself. And the word ought is a word that means you have a moral obligation to be what you say you are. And I think we're drawn to that as born-again Christians. But in John chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life. That's the sheep. That's us who follow his voice. I give unto them eternal life. They don't work for it. I give it to them. And they shall never perish it doesn't say, but they'll perish if they don't toe the line. It doesn't say that. And they shall never... He's not that... Jesus Christ is not a cosmic ogre. And that's what people who don't believe you can maintain your salvation after you receive Christ as Savior, they don't realize, but that's what they're making their Savior out to be, is to be some sort of a boogeyman. It's disgusting. There's entire denominations that make Jesus Christ out to be a boogeyman. It's disgusting. They don't understand the love of God. They don't understand what it means to have satisfied justice. That's sad. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any. Now, you have man there in italics, which means it's not in the original text, so you can just leave that out. And that shall any... Pluck them out of my hand. The Father who gave them to me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand or to seize them out. So this is the held in hand in God's hand viewpoint. We are held in God's hand. He's not going to let us slip out of his hand. Nor will he allow us to remove our hand from his hand. That's what I, the argument some people have is they say, well, you, you can let, God won't let go of your hand, but you can let go of God's hand. God's got your hand. You don't have his. That's the point. When we go into the store with our kids when they were little, we would hold their hand. We didn't have their hand on the outside holding ours. We held their hand. When we went down the street when our kids were little, and as long as we had them with us, we would hold their hand. Nobody or nothing was going to get them, and nothing that distracted them was going to get them away from us either. That's what you do for your children. They don't know what's best. They'll follow the ball into the street. They'll do the, they'll chase after the shiny, the, the shiny thing. They'll see something that's shiny and touch it, you know, and get electrocuted or shocked or something or whatever. They'll eat the red berry, thinking that it's good, and it's poisonous, perhaps. That's why you hold their hand until they mature, and then you still hold their hand. God never lets go of your hand. God lets go of your hands, whether you're kicking and screaming. He is not going to let go of your hand. He'll not allow anyone to take you out of his hand, including actions on our part or accusations on Satan's part God does not back away from his relationship with us he's like a pit bull or whatever he sinks his teeth in he's not letting up 
He grabs a hold of you. He's not letting go. We are stubborn sometimes. And in our decisions that we're going to do things our own way, which gets us into trouble, we might try to pull away like a child in a candy store. <laughs> I always thought it was cruel to take a child to a candy store and not let them have nothing. Good training, but I just, you know. <laughs> we're not building a bunch of little stoics here, you know. We try to pull away, though, like a child in the candy store at times and get stray from God. But God sees what we're doing. He already knew. And he sees what his son did for us. And he looks at his son's sacrifice and he looks at our hard headedness and our old, cause we've got old sin nature. And he says, for my son's sake, you can wiggle all you want, but I'm not letting go of you. I'm not letting go of you. And he doesn't let go. And John 6 and verse 37, John 6 verse 37 says, all that the father giveth me shall come to me. And him that comes to me, what does he say? I will in no wise cast out. The Father sees the Son in us at all times. And letting go of us would be like letting go of his very own Son. Because he sees us as one. That is, that's precious. He adopted us as if we were one of his own and he doesn't let go of us he doesn't he treats us with fairness and justice sometimes it's a woodshed sometimes it's where he puts us in time out and then there's times when he lavishes us with blessings of all sorts there's lots of kinds of blessings they're not all material the best kind are not material and that's a shame for a lot of christians because when you think about god's blessings they have this way because we're so earth we're people of the dirt and we relate to the earth, and we relate to great blessings of God as being a wad of this or a big chunk of that or a shiny this or that. But the greatest blessings are the ones that you can't handle with your flesh, but you handle in your spirit. That's the greatest blessings. All right. And the next one here is what we call the denial viewpoint. That'll be Second Timothy chapter 2, if you would, please. Second Timothy chapter 2, one of the pastoral epistles, as they call them. <clears throat> Some do. Second Timothy two. Denial viewpoint. Some people are just the queen of denial. So if you've heard that song before. <laughs> Once we are sealed in Christ by belief, we are in his service. Reference to falling out of God's favor is in reference to service or fellowship, not salvation. So here we go, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 12. Verse 11, it says. And what's what Paul's talking about in this thing here is that verse 5 of chapter 2 says, If a man also strive for the masteries, that is, the, the crowns, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. The masteries was the, the Olympic Games, and you had to work hard at it. If a man also, why does this, why doesn't it say a man and a woman? Because women weren't allowed to, uh, to be there. They didn't even watch the, they didn't even watch the games. There's a reason for that. I don't have to get into that tonight. But if a man also strive for the masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully, that is according to the rules. The farmer that labors, that's why you can't have cheating. You're not supposed to anyway. The farmer that labors first must be a partaker of the fruits. Right. Then he goes on to say, For which, as a servant of Christ, verse 8, I suffer trouble. That's just a fact of life for a Christian. Don't be afraid of you're going to get in trouble with your witnessing. That's par for the course, to be ridiculed. It's par for the course for the Christian who's doing their job to at times have heaped upon them the insults of people. Because you're in enemy territory. They don't like you. I'm not saying everybody doesn't like you. But when you stand for Christ and you have those that are opposed to Christ, they're going to let you know it. There are some who don't care and there are some who will receive your gospel witness. That's the, that's the plus side. 
But anyway, he says, verse 9, For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. There's a new term now. I don't know if you're all aware of it, but it's called Christian nationalist. It was used on a television show the other night on one of those Channel 7 uh, cop shows. And they were people who were supposedly church-going people, but they they were radicals in some form or fashion. That was not biblical. But they used the term Christian nationalist. And so I looked up what it is, what makes you a Christian nationalist. And one of the first things they say is that you have a flag in your church assembly. Oh, my word. We got one on the outside, too. I just want to let you all know. There's one on the outside, too, on a 40-foot pole, if you missed it. People died for us to have that freedom. It's a symbol of our freedom of the death and sacrifice of people. And we do have one inside the assembly. We don't say the Pledge of Allegiance when we have our church. We don't like that. We don't equate patriotism with godliness. Because some people are patriot and not godly. But we believe God ordained nationalism, Genesis chapter 9, Genesis chapter 11, for the preservation of a sovereign nation from divine wrath and divine justice being heaped upon that nation where God will, according to the teachings of the scripture, God can judge a nation or a nation that is cursed by association to another nation. That's Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse them that curse thee regarding Israel's sanctity in God's eyes. But 2 Timothy 2.11 says, It's a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. That's positional truth. If we suffer, that's endure undeserved suffering for your witness for Christ. It's not talking about having a toothache. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Now, you're not reigning with him now. You know, you're subject to making mistakes. But in the new body, in the millennial kingdom, you will reign with him if you suffer undeservedly and remain faithful for him. That's talking about service now, not salvation. We will reign with him. That's a future active indicative verb, first person plural. We will reign with him. Its context is service for, for blessing, not works for salvation. But if we deny him, he will also deny us. The context is reigning with Christ. If we will go through undeserved suffering for our Savior. He will elevate us in his millennial kingdom to a position of authority and leadership, reflecting him at a higher level than just uh, the average person. And we'll be in our glorified body, but some believers will not reign with Christ in his millennial kingdom. They will be born again. They will be in heaven. Don't get it wrong. They will be with Christ, but they will not reign with Christ. I don't know what they'll do. They may be your Uber driver. I don't know. But there is so much that's going to be involved because the knowledge of Jesus will be so thick during the millennial kingdom, you very well may be part of that giving out of the knowledge of Christ at different levels. You will be probably a part of the judicial system during the millennial reign of Christ because justice will be swift. There will be no militaries. There will be no prison. Justice will be swift. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Deny us what? Reigning with him. If we believe not, we're unfaithful, yet he abideth faithful. Why? Because he cannot deny himself. He cannot deny his own word, his own promise. In the believer's Christian service, which is what every believer does wherever they are, You don't have to be a preacher or something. In our Christian service, too often, there are times when we do deny the Lord for fear of perhaps losing our job or for keeping in favor with our friends and family or co-workers or neighbors or to keep from persecution as did Peter at Jesus' trial. 
We either do what we should not do, that is, grieving the Holy Spirit, or we do not do what we should do, which is quenching the Holy Spirit. So on occasion, we grieve the Holy Spirit by whom we are sealed. And we are sealed once for all. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave us because we grieve him. The Holy Spirit does not leave us or take take a, a retreat from us if we don't do what God wants us to do. He's there. He's not going anywhere. So on occasion, we grieve the Holy Spirit who seals us. The passive voice means we don't seal ourselves by our works, but we receive it. And the indicative mood of the word sealed is that there's no element of doubt. No doubt that we are sealed until the day of redemption. That's Ephesians 4 and verse 30. Just throw that in there. Sometimes we quench the Spirit of God. That means to pour water on His fire. Pour water on what He's trying to prompt us to do. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, Don't quench the Holy Spirit. In both cases, the believer is not obeying the will of God. In some cases, the believer may go a period of time living in disobedience, like the prodigal son, you know. But God our Father is obviously not pleased with us when we live this way. We know that. But after some period of time, if we do not make the adjustment to the justice of God, the justice of God will make an adjustment to us. And that's because God loves us. That's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6, 7, and 8. He disciplines and he pulls us back in if we are truly saved. If we're not saved, God's not even bothering us. We're not even consciously guilty for living wrong. But if you're truly born again, you're going to sense a guilt for living wrong, and God's going to make life so miserable for you that you can't stand it any longer. Some people endure for a long time. It's like some children. You can discipline and discipline and discipline, and they just get harder and harder and harder. And eventually God says, let me just set you on the shelf for a while until you calm down there, cool your jets a little bit. That's what God does. He loves us that much. That's love. A lot of parents think that's abuse if they if they just withhold blessing from their children in certain ways, like they gave them something and then they just spoiled it. They didn't appreciate it or respect it. Because somebody had to work hard for that. Somebody had to bust a knuckle or somebody had to take a chewing out from their boss in order for them to have that. I don't know how many times in my life, how many times I got chewed out in the job that I did. I had a lot of responsibility and I had a boss who was a bear, and I just got chewed out more times than I'd like to mention it. And I almost thought there was going to be, you know, a felony committed before I left the building that night. <laughs> now that it's 20 years behind me, I'm okay. There's no bodies buried out there. I'm going to just put it that way. There's no bodies buried out in the back in southeast Roanoke. I don't think so. No, there's not. But you take it for your family. And doggone your family better appreciate it. But a lot of people don't understand what mothers go through, what fathers go through, what supporters of the family. A lot of people do not appreciate what they go through. Now, if you've been having everything handed down to you, and then you have kids, and you want you expect everything to be handed down to them, then you are in a society that is bound for failure. That's not going to work. And all you got time to do is go out and riot in the street. And, 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 and using your voice to get people who are working every day to give you free stuff. That is what you call a parasite. A parasite. That's all that is. Don't take up with parasites. And after they suck the life out of you, you'll be locked up right along with them. Expecting somebody to do it for you too. That's not right. But God will hold us accountable. Whether our parents did or not, God will hold us accountable as Christians. And if after a period of time, if we don't confess and get right with the Lord and repent of what it is that we might have gotten into, then the divine discipline will follow in stages. And we've talked about different stages of divine discipline, but he's not going to cast you away. 
but you're not losing your salvation. Does this cause God to turn his back on his promise to eternal life? No. The Bible is clear that the answer is no. If we deny him, 2 Timothy 2.12 says, he will also deny us. But what he's denying us in context is reigning with him. That has nothing to do with salvation. It's talking about Christian service and future reward for that service. Now, every bit of Christian service you do for God now, whether it's talking to someone about the Lord or controlling yourself for God's glory, you get rewards for that in heaven. You don't have to be well known at all. All you got to do is be known by God. You don't have to have the whole world know you. All the all that matters is that God knows you. That's all that matters. You don't have to be Mr. Biggs. Some of you who knew Mr. Biggs was Sidney Poitier. Oh, so you're going to be Mr. Biggs. Something like that he said. You got to be all that Mr. Potato. That's what he called him. Mr. It was Mr. Frampton, you said, Mr. Potato. Big shot. Those that are faithful, the Bible says, shall reign with him. And if we deny him, though we are yet in him, we will not be allowed to reign with him. That's a form of granting. And the word reigning here in this passage in Second Timothy has to do with being granted authority as a representative of the kingdom of Christ. His millennial kingdom. You are granted authority in his name. It's just like you have a ring with his signet. And wherever you go, of course, you'll be in a glorified body at that time, resurrected glorified body. You will have on your person whatever position you are holding during that time, whatever rank you are holding during that time. He has got an organized kingdom. And it will be glorious. But we're dealing with a lot of unsaved people during that kingdom period, too. And those would be the ones that you and I could be able to influence for Christ through keeping his word and keeping his law during that time. We'll have no problem with it because we won't have a sin nature. <laughs> they will. But there is a reward for staying strong in the Lord. Isaiah 53 and verse 12, that long passage there. He's, you know, he was bruised for our iniquities. His stripes we were healed. But it gets on down there. It says it pleased the Lord to bruise him that put him to grief because he made his soul an offering for sin. Isaiah 53, 10. And God would see the travail of his soul and be satisfied that he has paid the ultimate price. Then he says, importantly here, therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall then divide the spoil with the mature, the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And so there are a lot of believers, though positionally say they're losers, because they would rather be entertained, they would rather have their ego stroked, they would rather live for the flesh, but not an honorable Christian. We don't feel that way. We just don't feel that way. Revelation 5 and verse 10, if you just want to jot it down, I don't think I put it on the, on the board there. Revelation 5, verse 10, this is when Jesus took the seal <laughs> from, G from the Father. The Lamb though it looked as if it was slain, walked up beside the throne of the Father in heaven because there was no one to open the seal, no one to share what was coming down the pike. And he came, verse 7, and took the scroll out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. That's that's Jesus. A land though it, as though it had been slain, verse 6 says. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of saints. They sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, not out of works, but by thy blood, and out of every kindred and every tongue and every people and nation has made unto us our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign. What's it say right there? On the 
earth. All millennialists do not believe that there's going to, many of them do not believe that there's going to be a literal, now some do, but many of them do not believe there's going to be a literal physical kingdom of Christ upon this earth. That's not at all what the Bible teaches. Of uh, the prophecy has, that is yet to be fulfilled, a major portion of it is Jesus reigning on this earth. And it will be changed during that time. There will be geographical changes. There will be climate change. Talking about climate change. There will be climate changes, all right. The Dead Sea will will be able to hold life. It won't be the salt sea, as some people call it anymore. There will be places where it's desert. It will be made to, to bloom and, and flower and be fruitful. It will be wonderful. There won't be war everywhere. That was made unto us, our God, a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That's during the millennium. That's not on the new heaven and new earth. That's not up in the sky somewhere, as some suppose. That's on the earth. So that reigning in Second Timothy has to do with reigning with Christ if we learn to will and to suffer with him in our life. Undeserved suffering, of course. All right. So we will share in the spoils of his victory at the cross as faithful believers, provided we don't turn our backs on the faith, but we'll still not lose our salvation. That's got to do with reigning. We may turn our back at times on our faith by our actions. May just be a little bit during a day or might be a habit or whatever. But God will never turn his back on his promise to himself. God will never lie to anyone, much less himself. He will not deny himself. If we believe not, that is, if we are negative and we're unfaithful, trying to pay our own way, he still abides faithful. Positional truth. That he cannot deny himself. God's presence in the believer is always the dominant factor in eternal security. I just hope people could see that and understand that. God's presence in the believer is always the dominant factor in eternal security, not our contribution or our will. My will does not keep me in the family of God. God's will does. My contribution does not keep me in the family of God. The blood of Christ is the contribution that keeps me in the family of God. Some people have yet to learn that. It's comforting to know it. It's empowering to know that. It is humbling and empowering to know that. There are those who like to make you think that they are holier than you are and all they're trying to do is prove to themselves that their brand of righteousness is acceptable to God and they are so far from the truth. <laughs> it, it comes across as arrogance because that's exactly what it is. The integrity of God to be faithful to what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross is undeniable. Number five... The family viewpoint. Just jot it down if you want to. I'll give you all these copies if you want. Galatians 3.26, for you are all, it says, the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's what that verse says. Family viewpoint is the fifth viewpoint on eternal security or perseverance provided by God. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.26. Everybody says, oh, we're all children of God. The Bible get, says no, by faith in Christ Jesus. John 1 and verse 12 says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's important. Number six, inheritance viewpoint. I don't know if you are anywhere near of the... 1 Peter chapter 1, but if you want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 or write it down, this is the sixth viewpoint, inheritance viewpoint. This is where this point comes in. Inheritance viewpoint. 1 Peter chapter 1. You're, you have an inheritance. You know that. 
in the Lord. And you're not waiting to get it. It's not an inheritance that you get when you get there. It's already yours. It's already got your name on it. First Peter 1 verse 4 says, uh, First of all, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again by the living hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. It is an inheritance that is incorruptible. You can't corrupt it. It is undefiled. I mean, God wouldn't defile it, but you could. You can't defile it. And it fades not away. It is reserved in heaven for you. Who? You who are kept. Military term there. Tereo means to be have a military guard on it. God's justice keeps a military guard on that reservation of your eternal security. Who are kept by the power of God and your inheritance. You are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. We are heirs to eternal life. And once you receive Christ, you become an heir. You don't get unhitched, unaired. <laughs> this is not taken away from the believer, like somebody who's written the will out to their heirs or friends or whatever. And then they get out in a spernickety mood and they get all mad at them. I'm cutting you out of my will cutting you out of my will well you see if god cut us out of his will then he'd have to cut jesus out too he wouldn't do that and he had to cut himself out because he just broke his own promise to himself i think sometimes believers don't realize it but they have an agenda and that agenda is i believe that somewhere somehow something inside of me matches up can be can be compared to some degree with the holiness of God. <laughs> they really have to have that mindset that they actually believe that there's something inherent in them that makes them worthy of the holiness of God. And there are a lot of people who do not believe in original sin who hold that point of view. Those who work along the lines of social justice do not believe in original sin, so they believe that we are flawed, but we're not that flawed. We've got some qualification within us that is worthy if there be a divine power. For the very religious, they do believe that. But anyway. Anyway, inheritance. We are heirs to eternal life. And a lot of other stuff too, apparently. And that's not taken away. So I want us to look at two things about inheritance. Number one, there are two different kinds of uh, inheritances. There's joint heirs and there's inheritances. First of all, impersonal blessings go to all believers. Or an impersonal inheritance is guaranteed to all believers. In other words, regardless, unconditionally, every believer is going to have a glorified body. Every believer is going to have all their old sin nature taken away from them. They'll never see that again. Every believer is going to be in happiness when they are in with the presence of the Lord. There will never be another sorrowful day. There will never be another tear, another crying, no difficulties like that. Great fellowship. They'll never miss out on all those things, okay? That's an impersonal guarantee. Goes to all believers. It's the basic package, in other words. These are strategic blessings. Now, we're going to talk about tactical blessings next. But these are what we call strategic blessings that all believers receive. Because everybody that gets saved while on the earth, you all get the indwelling Holy Spirit. You get the, 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 the brought back to life, the human spirit, the imputed righteousness of God. You get that in other things here in time. Eternal life, you get that. That would be what we call a uh, a strategic, impersonal guarantee or blessing. All believers go to heaven. We all get glorified bodies. We all enjoy the heavenly comforts of being with the Lord. Okay? That's inheritance. But then there's number two. There's personal blessings. Personal guarantees to the faithful. But... Out of all the basics that you get, there is also the qual, there's also the opportunity 
for you to become qualified for extra grace blessings. That's 2 Timothy 2.12, just as we read. Isaiah 53.12, as we read. Reigning with Him, if we are willing to live for Him as we should. There are crowns that you and I can inherit or earn. So, so the first inheritance is something that everything is done because of what God has done for all of us. The second one is what you have earned. So it's qualified based upon your your performance or your living out your life with the Lord, both private and publicly. So there's a lot to be lost. And so many believers don't understand how much they are putting themselves in a position to lose if they don't get into the Word of God and get the Word of God in them and make the character that God wants it to be. A lot of believers don't understand how much they have to lose because you don't get to earn it once you get there. You have to earn it down here. And it's not so much in what you do, it's what you are. So there are personal blessings that go to those believers who qualify through their positive volition to the Word of God, their humility, their ability to do the things they need to do. These are called tactical blessings. Those believers will reign during the thousand-year reign with Christ. They are decorated with eternal rewards for faithful service, for your service now. Remember, there's no faithful service. In that sense, you earn those rewards now, and you take those into eternity in the in eternal state as well. That's Romans 8 and verse 17. Romans 8 and verse 17. I know I'm pushing my time limit here. I know there's eight chapters in this book. Romans 8 and verse 17. It says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. Hello, hello, hello. Here's where that comes in. You see, we all heirs, but then we're joint heirs. And that joint heirs with Christ goes back to Isaiah 53 and verse 12 and 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12. We're joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we're willing to go through undeserved suffering for him in our testimony, in the way that we will sacrifice in this life for him. You know, the Bible says very clearly, do not be weary in what? Well-doing. Because there is a reward for that. God wants to heap rewards on us, but there are things that we must do to qualify for that. This is where we can't be sleepy when it comes to this, because you're the one that will be missing out. I'm the one that will be missing out at the beam of seat of Christ. And then everything else that goes with that. The, un- the believer who does endure undeserved suffering for the Lord does not stop being a witness because somebody slammed the door in her face or they treated him wrong. Or they got into some sort of sin, they wouldn't give it up. You just keep doing the right thing. You're not perfect. You have to use 1 John 1, 9 from time to time yourself. But you don't give up when the chips are down. And you don't forget God when you're rolling in the dough. You don't forget God when it's all happy, do do good. Everything just rolling nice along. That's when so many people forget God. Oh, I got this. This is lined up here. That's lined up there. Everything is all golden. That's when you start seeing your gold turn to rust. You don't give up when the chips are down. And you don't give up when you're on top of the mountain either. You mortify the members of the flesh, Colossians 3, 5. You watch your tongue and you watch your attitude and you do it with truth and humility. You're an honorable Christian. Those are wonderful personal blessings. Personal guarantees are conditional upon qualification. And there's your verses. We just talked about that. Hmm, pushing it. Well, let me just throw one other thing in here in regard to inheritance. And I'll just throw this out here, and maybe we'll hit it a little bit Sunday morning as we start the next one. But uh, this, again, is under the sixth viewpoint of inheritance, and that is the prodigal son of Luke 15:24. He was the son of the father. 
He was, he was, as a picture there, he was a child of God or he was a son of the Father and he was in what is known as temporal death. He was out of fellowship. He had been out of fellowship with his father for some time, but after he was away, he started eating with the hogs. His friends, his uh, fair weather friends had gone. He'd spent his fortune and he repented and he returned to his father after spoiling his earthly inheritance. And sometimes Christians, there is an earthly inheritance for us. I mean, the Bible is very clear about that, that you work hard, you'll, you'll do good for yourself. That's the way it should be. And then God may take it from you anyway, like he did Job, and maybe give you back twice as much in the end, and maybe not, for his own testing, for his own glory, and for your good. But after this prodigal son returned home to his father, after spoiling his earthly inheritance and wine, women, and song, well, his father, when he came, welcomed him with open arms. He was looking forward to his son coming home. There he comes dragging up the highway, hat in hand, bad shape. The son who had stayed with his father, well, he's a picture of the believer that thinks his brother doesn't deserve forgiveness. That his brother doesn't deserve the father's favor after being AWOL for so long. This is the difference between legalism and grace. Legalism believes you have to earn your father's love. Grace means it's free. <laughs> I don't think I've got a C on this. Yeah, I what? It was a prodigal son, self-righteous brother who thought the wayward son was unworthy of the father's forgiveness and acceptance. We'll stop with this little page right here. This is the last one. It was a prodigal son's self-righteous brother who thought his wayward brother, the wayward son, was unworthy of the father's forgiveness and acceptance. And that's how some people are when it comes to eternal security. They don't think if you've done something really bad that you deserve God to forgive you because they wouldn't. That's the point. They are measuring their righteousness with the righteousness of God. And they are dead wrong. It was not the father who felt that way. The father did not cast out his son, but his brother would have thrown him out on his duff. His brother would have ran him off the, off the property. It was the self-righteous brother who rejected his wayward brother. It's the self-righteous brother who rejects eternal security. The legalist, self-righteous believer rejects eternal security because they can't believe that God would be so good as to let somebody other than themselves stay in the family of God with the things she did, the things that he did. And they try to pull in a little small tribe through their self-righteous attitudes to try to keep that little tribe together. And they're very controlling type of people. All I can say is get away from somebody like that as fast and as far as you can because they're nothing but trouble. I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse them that curse thee. There's a, such a thing as called blessing by association through that principle in Genesis 12 and verse 3. There's also a thing called cursing by association, and that's biblical separation. Not self-righteousness, but biblical separation, because stink has a way of rubbing off on those who rub up against it. I won't fellowship with stinky believers. I'm talking about spiritually speaking, because they have a way of rubbing off on influencing you. They don't have to be some morally corrupt person, but they can be what I call a moral reprobate. They use the morality in a pervasive and a perverted way that is their standard of holiness. And they're always just a little bit holier than you are. They've got some special thing that they won't do. There's no Bible verse for it. And they're famous for coming up with all kinds of things that are holier than everybody else does that you can't find in Scripture. <laughs> they're like those who wrote some of the commentaries off of the Old Testament. They found ways to make themselves even holier than God, called the traditions of men. Anyway, 
They accused Jesus' disciples of not washing their hands exactly the right way before they ate and different things. You know that. So we have to be cognizant that we are in Christ because of what he's done. That's the glorious, glorious thing about that. I'm glad any believer gets back in the saddle. Any believer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and your blessings. Thank you for saving us in our eternal life. Thank you for your kindness. We thank you that in the midst of our craziness at times that you remain gentle with us. We know that as sheep we are at times skittish. And so we just pray, Father, that we'll be calmed by the chief shepherd who will take the word, will satisfy our soul, that will give us the drink of the water of life, that will give us rest in his green pastures that will give us confidence and courage once we're restored to go with him through whatever valleys we're going to go through, whether it's the valley of the shadow of death or what have you, or prosperity or the valley of despair and ill health. Whatever it might be, we realize, Father, that the more we stay in the word, the closer we stay to your son and the more comforted we are. We thank you that this will not go on forever. One day we will leave this flesh and be in the presence of Almighty uh, Savior and your presence in the third heavens. So we ask, Father, that you just help us to stay strong until then, and we count on you for that. Thank you for everyone that's come out tonight. We ask you to bless each one. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.